Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Diabetics Doing Things. We're telling the amazing stories of people with diabetes from all over the world. And today, I think, is a first on the podcast. I am on the West Coast of the United States. Eritrea is in Dallas. And our amazing guest, Sam Elaine from the UK. She's Stormtrooper Sam. She lives with diabetes, and she's here on the show. Sam, welcome so much. It's so glad to have you. We've been talking about doing this. I, I know. It's been a long time, years even, I think. But yeah, it's been amazing. And it's amazing to be here, finally. And, and Sam, you know, we're going to talk a lot about your career today, but you, like, it's, it's just such a cool thing for, for me to say as a person with diabetes, because not only are you, we're going to talk about your life as the first stormtrooper with diabetes, but you're the first female stormtrooper in, in Star Wars. So you've been in all five of the Disney Star Wars movies. You were in Andor season one, which was amazing and, and premiered last fall on Disney plus. But like, what, what is it like for you? To like when you hear somebody say that out loud that you are the first female stormtrooper, like what what is that like to just to live that life? Um, I still, to be honest, it's still quite quite a lot to get my head around. I still pinch myself that it's even tr true. So, um, I think so. There's a there's a bit of contention over over the over the, the, the title, but basically, before me, there was no designated female sort of, but there was a, a lady, Tracy, the, a stunt lady back in the 70s, and she wore the suit. But in terms of there being a designated female sword trooper who had a female and being an actor actually in the suit, that was me. So yeah, it's like I said, it's still a lot to get my head around. I still pinch myself. We've had a few more ladies over the years, but it, it invariably is just me on set with Lots and lots of men. So, yeah, I still pinch. I've got JJ Abrams to thank. He came along for episode seven, Fourth Awakening, in 2014, and started shooting to Soul Troopers and realized that there were no females and was like, quite rightly, why not? And let's do something about that. So, yeah, JJ is the reason, and I'm still here. Oh, it's so cool. And can't wait to see you. I, lo I love your hashtag on social media, Spot Sam, when you know, can see you. <laughs> in the yeah. episodes and in the movies that was that was and all because so like a lot of people asked me how do you know you know how can you support yourself you all look the same so basically it's quite easy really because usually there isn't too many of us in a city quite often there's only two of us in the scene or you know maybe four or five whatever but it's very rare that there's lots and lots of us obviously there's that huge scene in um Force Awakens when we were at the rally and General Rux was giving that speech, which was largely CGI because they'll scan us and so then they'll replicate lots and lots of troopers. We don't have that many troopers available. And then the, the, the same in The Last Jedi, there's a big scene with Benicio del Toro where there's lots and lots of us. But other than that, it's quite often quite small scenes. So I'm very good at remembering where I'm standing. So I've always been quite good at playing spot sound, but the thing with Andor, which was really nice, was I, we knew that we weren't going to be really featured until the end of the series because we were told that when we got to set. So for the first few episodes, I was just like, because usually you have to remember, when I go to the cinema, I'm waiting for me to pop up on the screen because I don't know how they fit all of the story together. So at any given moment, I could be on screen. So I'm constantly in anticipation and I'm not really concentrating on the movie. I'm just waiting to see myself, which sounds a bit egotistical, but you know, you would too. So anyway, <laughs> it was so nice to finally be able to just relax and watch. And that's what I did in Andor. And then I was like, oh, because I was so relaxed and enjoying it, I'm like, oh, let's play a little game. So yeah, we invented Spot Sound, which was, I think you guys call it Where's Waldo. We call it Where's Wally, which is the stripy guy. So yeah, that was my version of Where's Waldo, Where's Wally, Where's Sam, Got Sam. And yeah, it was really fun. I think we started on like episode six or something. If you guys go to my social media, you can see all the little little bit of me through Angle. But yeah, it was really fun. And of course it culminated. I got some really cool shots. I finally, after eight years, you know, seven, six project, I finally got the money shot of the holding the blaster with a laser coming out the end. 
I got to just, tell you, that was amazing. It was um, super cool. Yeah, and, 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 and we get yeah. to see it in that big, you know, culminating scene in that big, you know, action sequence. The finale, really awesome. which was amazing. And then there's another scene with, I forget his name. He's like one of the officers. And he's looking out of the windscreen of the spaceship and looking out. And then you just see two troopers behind him. And there's a reflection. Such an epic scene. I think it was at the end of one of the uh, the episodes. And that, it. I think I'm going to print that and frame it. So I've got two really amazing shots that, that I love. You can see all those on my social media. But yeah, spot sound was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, it's very cool. And we're going to talk more about your career, you know, as an actor and what it's like to be Stormtrooper Sam on set. But let's go back in time a little bit and let's talk about you joining the type 1 diabetes family and tell us about your diagnosis and what that was like for you. So I have been diabetic for 32 years, I think. Basically, it was 1989. I was nine years old. I have been really quite ill for like a long time. And my mum had taken me to the, the GP, the, the local, local doctor, so many times. And he kept saying that I had the flu. I know a lot of people get sort of, especially back then, it was the 1980s, you know, stuff wasn't as advanced sure. as we are now. I was incredibly thin um, to the point where I was a ballerina and I nearly went pro, but, you know, I got too tall and stuff. But I remember that's my, doing... That's, my, that's what happened to me too. I was too tall to be so... <laughs> and... Too tall to be a ballerina. And when the Princess Diana had the same problem, actually, she, she, got, she got too tall to be a ballerina. Anyway. I digress. I was so thin that I remember, and I was nine, but this is one of those memories that really sticks in my head. I was doing the show and I came out on stage and it was in like a big local theatre. And I came out on stage to do a ballet solo and I had this tiny little white tutu on. And the audience just went, yeet, and gasped in horror mm. because I have had, because of how thin I was. I think I have a photo somewhere, but I was sort of skeletal. I was tall, so that made it look worse. I was just bones, basically, arms and legs. You could just see all my bones. So, yeah, I remember, I remember that the first time I thought there was something wrong. Of course, I was, I hope people know the symptoms. You know, I was thirsty all the time, going to the bathroom a lot. But, yeah, the weight loss was horrific. But yeah, I, reach, I remember that feeling of constant thirst and always needing to go to the bathroom. But I was, yeah, I just, I looked ill. I was extremely thin and just sick a lot, you know, like cold, flu, and, you know, no infections and whatnot. So yeah, and she just kept on, kept on taking me because she knew something was up. And then finally she took me to the hospital, to the emergency room. And yeah, they were like, if you'd left it a week later, she probably wouldn't be here anymore. So, yeah, it's a bit sad, but thank God we, my mum took the initiative. And so, yeah, I went, we went to the A&E and I remember the doctor, he was lovely. And, you know, they was quite quickly realised what was wrong with my key sure. and my blood sugar and whatnot. And then I just remember, because I don't like to talk about all this stuff, so I like to I'm very much a positive person and I like to see the humor in it. I think it's very important to find joy in everyday situations. But I just remember, um, I'm a big foodie. I love food. I realized yesterday that I spend most of the day thinking about what I'm going to eat next. And my mum used to be a chef, professional chef. So she's a very, very good cook. And I just remember when the doctor was explaining to me that I was diabetic now and that I would have to do change things and watch what I eat and stuff. I was, my mum was in tears and I was looking at my mum and I was looking at this doctor and then the first thing I said was, can I still eat my mum's lasagna? <laughs> and I was just like, yeah. And I was, he, my mum laughed and it, you know, it made her laugh, which is nice because she was really upset. Sure. So yeah, that was what I was most worried about was eating. And so, you know, after that, I was in hospital for quite a while, actually, because I was so ill. And they, I was very lucky. I don't know, I, I doubt they do this now, but I think because I was so ill, I literally was like, 
diabetes boot camp. Um, I had lessons every day. I had, they were giving me an orange to inject. They gave me a high pump on purpose to see how it would feel, but it was under sort of supervision of all the doctors and nurses. So I kind of was, because I was in hospital for about three months, because I was, remember I was going to school in hospital, I had a school room. Oh, wow. I was there for ages. Yeah, I was there for like three months. But I think because I was there, I was very lucky to get that sort of crash course in diabetes. And my consultant then, back then, he was a very famous doctor, Dr. Albright, Jeremy Albright. He was like a leading diabetic consultant. So I was really lucky. I had really good care. And I learned, you know, all the basics, which now probably don't even apply. And, you know, it was back, back in the days of the vials and the syringes. But yeah, I had this crash course in diabetes in the hospital. And yeah, it was, it was, I, I, I remember like, I don't feel like I, I was sad or upset. I just remember kind of just getting on with it. I think that's what you have to do in diabetes. You just get right. on with it. It's a period of adjustment. And then I think because I was young, I was nine. I wasn't, I wasn't a teenager yet. There was a puberty. I wasn't, I wasn't feeling that peer pressure. That all came later. But at that point, I don't want to say I had a good time in hospital, but you know, it, it was, it wasn't, I, I even remember my nurse's name. Her name was Anna. She was Irish. And my uncle gave me, no, my auntie gave me a, a little dog, a little Victoria, and I named her Anna after my nurse. There's lots of little memories. And my uncle gave me a pink Walkman and the Batman Bobby Brown soundtrack or Ghostbusters. Anyway, I remember all these weird things that happened. Is it, isn't that funny it. how, you know, it's such a core memory and like such a big moment for you. And, and, you know, I think that it, listening to your story, it's very similar in some ways to, you know, my story in Eritrea's as well. We, we were diagnosed at the same hospital, not, not very far apart and still had very different experiences. And, you know, to hear that, you know, even something as simple as, can I eat my mom's lasagna? And the answer was yes. You know, you mentioned finding the positive in you know, the, in the difficult situations, that's such an important thing, just giving you permission to be normal and, and do something that you like. And I think that early on, especially in the first, like, you know, days, weeks that you're you know introduced to this disease, the way that people introduce topics to you can make a huge difference in the rest of your life because you start to, you know, oh, I, I can do this or, you know, or I have learned how to do this or even like, you know, what a hypo feels like. And, you know, I, I kind of remember you know, my, my hospital stay was really only about three days, but it was very similar diabetes boot camps every day. Somebody came in and taught me something new and, and yeah, I mean, it just sets you on a, a nice foundation and, and it's amazing how much like in those traumatic experiences that we all remember just because it was such an important yeah. part of, you know, of our lives. So yeah, let's, like, talk you, sorry, <laughs> no sign. Go ahead. If you say like, even now, if you say to somebody, oh, I'm diabetic, the first thing they'll say is, oh, does that mean you can't do this? Or does that mean you can't? So often people associate diabetes with, you know, things you can't do and what the limitations of it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to, like that guy said, yeah, the doctor said, yeah, of course you can still eat your mum's lasagna. It's, it's not always about what we can't do. It's about, you know, learning to, to, to fight on what we can. And, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in that, you know, the constraints and everybody has constraints, whether they have live with a chronic illness or whether. You know, they have a job that, you know, limits them to a certain amount of time or whatever the case may be. And I think, you know, where we, you know, find success and joy is just by taking those constraints and having as much fun within them as we can. And, and you know, really exploring the boundaries of the constraints. And that is, you know, real creativity to me. And I, I, I'm just excited to see, you know, that we have so many people living with diabetes. And that means that there's a lot of different personalities and a lot of different outlooks. And I love finding those common threads of, people making the best of what they've been given and, and you know, taking yeah. it as, as far as they'd like to. So I mentioned this earlier, we, we've had working actors on the podcast before, but you know, you are often part of the extended cast, especially as Stormtrooper Sam. So I'd love to know, you know, a huge production, these, these Star Wars films are massive, massive productions. What's a typical day in the life on, on set like for Stormtrooper Sam? Well, okay, so yeah, they are huge productions. Um, quite often I've been in really huge scenes. So there, there can be like 
you think the most we had is like 500 extra sitting in C. So that's a lot of people to get ready. So we'll have to start very early. We don't obviously need hair and makeup. But, but they like to get they they like to get us there early so that we can get you know into our costume. And we're quite lucky though they'll they'll most they'll often just get us in our base layers and then when we get nearer to the time then they'll put the rest of the costume on. So yeah, very early start. We usually have our morning meal breakfast before costume, so can be quite difficult because. I don't usually eat breakfast like at four, five o'clock in the morning. But 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 now yeah, I know that usually around eight o'clock when I will we'll we're gonna be on set filming. So it's not us having to kind of shift thing and forward planning, forward thinking, much like every other diabetic. But there are some, you know, some has not so like yeah basically i'll try and have like a carb free bit breakfast for instance so i'll have just like the bacon and the egg and some coffee lots of black coffee to keep me going and usually won't take my because yeah i because i'm not eating carbs that early and then if i do bolus then i know i can take it before i've got my costume on because I'm still in my, my, my normal clothes because I said to you earlier, once you get that costume on, it's not easy to inject. I've had, uh, customized bits of costume over the years. Costume department are amazing. Everyone's amazing on stalls, but we're like a family and they can do whatever they need for me to, to get through. So quite often I'll have a, a special job suit that's got like a hole here. Or a hole in the thigh so that I can unclip my leg at my thigh piece if it's the Sayana and then inject in my thigh or in my arm. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll usually, yeah. So usually if I'm hungry, I'll boil in the morning and before I put my push on. If not, then I'll just, just eat, yeah, carbs. Sorry, just the protein, bacon, eggs, coffee. And then get on set. And then I have a bag, a kit bag. We're not usually allowed personal items on set because there's a lot of us and, you know, they'd just be stuck everywhere. Sure. But I have a I have a bag that's transparent, like a makeup artist bag, with my name on it and type 1 diabetic. And I have all of the snacks, all of the chocolate bars, all of the glucose, insulin, everything in there. Um, and warmer stuff like that, just to to keep me comfortable and safe. And you know, they're really good about me taking it as close to the set as possible. If we're if sets like a little bit away from the holding area, then I'll take it with me, and then it will be hidden somewhere. Just because you never know, and it it the time it takes for me to go back to where you know it's it's just nicer to have it there. And well, so, yeah. I, I I want to talk about that too, because you mentioned, you know, the costume department has, has made like custom cutouts for you and you know, that you're, you're allowed to bring your bag there. You know, it sounds like you manage on multiple daily injections and I, I think you wear a Libre CGM, right? Yeah. Yeah. I see. I've I, got, I do I've my got research. I got my research. Yes. Well done. I, I have, yeah, I have the Libre too. I actually got a message from them this morning from Abbott to say that I can't update my phone because there's a problem just for anyone listening. Don't, if you're on Android, don't update to 13 because the eBay won't work. Anyway, so I never used to have the Libre. So it's quite difficult to get it here on prescription. I think they've changed the rules now. So everyone is going to get it, but they're going to, I think it might, they might be getting the Dexcom, not the Libre. But I eventually got it because I, as talk about that later, but I have been having some problems with my diabetes because of the length of time. So I finally got it. And so you're not allowed to take fun onto the stalls. We, as soon as you get to work, you give your phone in, they give you a number. Because obviously security, phone scrolls. So you've had problems over the years with people sure. doing naughty things. And it was only on Andor. Yeah, Andor's the first time that I've had to use, you know, the Libre 
So that was like interesting in itself because I had to say to the AD, like, actually, I can't surrender my phone anymore. I need it to test because with the two, you can't use the meter and your phone. You have right. to use the reader. Sorry, you have to use the phone. But then you're amazing. You know, I put it on airplane mode mostly and the AD will have it. It can be a little bit troublesome because the AD is in charge of a lot of us. And so in Ferret, the, the, the set was so big. It was like a life-size tower that you could walk around for hours. And I'd need to scan or I'd feel a bit unwell. And he would be like somewhere else. And I, there'd all be radio in the heaven, no one. So yeah, it can, it can be really its own unique challenges. But then, you know, I always have my blood test kit just in case. So, you know, I find my way back to where I'm going to do that. But the one thing that I forgot about was the alarms because I don't know, for you non-diabetic or for people that don't have knee brain, the default alarm of that thing is horrific. It will make your ears bleed. It's so loud and so piercing. And literally, I think I forgot first time that I'd, I'd overridden the system to like, it, to go off the, in spite of it being on silent or do not disturb or And it went off and like, that's not good to, for anyone to make a noise when you're making a film or TV show, like to disturb what they're doing is horrible. As anyone with a cough will, will, tell, will tell you, especially now after COVID. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I learned very quickly after that to make sure that the, that it was completely off. Well, and I've managed you, to now. You, you bring up a good point though. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting. I know some of our connection is a little bit laggy today, but you know, those are those like kind of moments where everybody's looking at you because of your diabetes. Those are very difficult, especially in like professional settings where you like don't want to cause a disturbance. Like you don't want to be, you know, difficult to work with or anything like that. So how do you, how do you approach like discussing your diabetes with other cast and crew on set, like during, and even like wardrobe, like, you know, do you, do you bring it up ahead of time? And like, how do you advocate your, for yourself in those moments? I, I, I don't like to like go around and like advertise, like, you know, broadcast, like, no, there's anything shamed of, but you know, we've all got stuff doing and I, in with like things like the phone making a noise and things like that, I have to, I'd like, I do say very quickly, you know, sorry, I was like, because I don't want people to see, oh, she's just got on the phone and, you know, she's just got a text sure. message or something because that looks awful and nobody wants to be that guy that keeps their phone on during work. Also, the other extras aren't allowed their phones. So when they see me with my phone, they're like, why is she getting special treatment? That's not fair. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, sorry, I'm diabetic. I have to use this to, to scan. And again, like jumping the line to, to, to get my, my lunch fast before anyone or being given extra time because quite often we'll have, we'll be, and they'll be like, guys, because we get continuous days, so we don't actually get a lunch break. They're just gracious enough to give you five minutes to sit and eat. Whereas I need to, if I've bolus already, I need to eat everything that's on the plate. And so <laughs> I'll be sat there. I'll be sat there by myself when everyone's gone back, just quickly shoveling this food down because I have to eat it all because I've already taken my insulin. So there's all these different things. I, I, like I said, I don't go around advertising. I will explain it to other extras if need be or to staff. I like, I always like to tell the medic every day because we have different medics because obviously they need to be aware and my AD, my, my, the person directly in charge of me will know. So yeah, I think it's very important to let people know medic case of a medical emergency. But other than that, I don't really let people know, but unless I have to, because they've learned like, why is she getting extra treat, a special treat? Right. But I do think it's very, very important to not feel embarrassed about things like that, because at the end of the day, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Um, and I've worked, I think I was on Maleficent 2, and there was a, a, a boy, a young boy with diabetic type 1, and he, he wasn't being very good about it. And he was like, like not doing what he should because he was worried about 
what they'd say or what they and I was like, no, 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 don't do that because you're putting your life in danger. You, you're going to end up ill. And I said, they're amazing. Speak to them. Give them your meds. Do what you need to do. Because at the end of the day, like you said, we all have issues, whatever they may be. And our health comes first. So don't ever feel embarrassed or like ashamed or like, you know, oh, it makes me different. To, to to go and put yourself forward and say like I need to, I have no shame in going like no I will not because I've had like people shout at me and say why are you still doing sitting there eating we told you and I'm like I'm diabetic I need to finish this and I have no shame in doing that because I get it you're doing your job this is my house and that kind of right. Thing. I think it's really important and thank you for sharing that story about working with, you know, a, a co-star and, and, and helping, helping him advocate for himself too, because I think it's really important for adults who are already in these situations who, you know, are these amazing people like yourself who were celebrating your accomplishments. But I think it's also super important to talk about the work that happens between the time you get on set and the time that we see you on screen. And it doesn't look the same every day. And you're having multiple conversations with medics. You have multiple conversations with ADs. You're advocating for yourself. And I think it's just important to know that even, even though we have a couple of extra steps or we need, a, we need a few extra accommodations, that that's not a burden and, you can, and people will accommodate you. And it's important for you to advocate for yourself in those conversations, even though it feels like the most embarrassing, the most difficult thing to do in the moment. Once you do it, I think you, you really do get a, like a muscle memory for advocating for yourself and it becomes more comfortable. And then, you know, even when somebody's in a high stress situation and maybe yells at you or something, you're able to say, Hey, I'm just taking care of my health. I'm just taking care of my diabetes. And, and then, and for the most part, at least in my experience, most people, even in those kind of high stress situations, when you're able to communicate that they take us, take a breath, take a step back and, and kind of let you do your thing. So thank you for, for advocating for yourself and, and, you know, and others and in those little moments. You also online, I, I, I would categorize you as like a, as a fierce advocate for rights for people with diabetes and costs of, of treatment and, and insulin and, you know, access to CGM, you know, how did you find the diabetes online community and, and, you know, get, get involved and use your voice to, you know, to talk about things that everyday diabetics are going through and, and are struggling with all across the world? So things are quite different, I think, for people here in the UK versus you guys in the US. Invariably, it's like insulin is free and we actually have free prescription or medication because of all the complications that are associated with diabetes and all the, the knock-on effects, you know. We get a lot of infections, so we'll need antibiotics, for example. So they're aware of the fact that you don't just need free insulin, you need free this and free this and free this. And I'm very, very grateful, very lucky, and, you know, I'm aware of how privileged I am to have that. But I also am aware of how many people don't have that. And I find it actually incredibly upsetting, some of the story, like, basically, I think once, once I joined sort of Instagram and things, Twitter and things, and you, you, you write one post about diabetes, then you'll get someone follow you. And then there's that like, you know, domino effect. And I think that's basically what happened with me finding at these different accounts such as yours and then beyond swipe one and things like that. And so once I started to see these accounts and stuff. And obviously I was already aware of the disparity of, of the global experience for diabetic. But I was aware of like the real ins and outs and nitty gritty of it. And I remember that I changed insulin a couple of years ago from Nova Rapid, never near, to Theas and Tresiba. And so I had a lot of insulin that I wasn't going to use. And I obviously reached out, like, well, I went online and did some research and there was a charity that usually collects insulin that's non-expired for, like, third world countries, etc. 
But unfortunately, they weren't collecting because of COVID. And I happened to find YouTube, an Instagram account for, I think it's called Diabetic Dad. And he basically had, you're not supposed to do this. It's against the law. But he'd sent insulin to the States to somebody who needed it. And he'd written a blog post about his experience and how he did it, et cetera, and keeping it cold and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I didn't do that, but I, I'll be straight with you. I really wanted to because who wants to throw away personally yeah. the incident? And so because of the, his reading his story, and I spoke to him, I reached out to him, and I was like, look, do you know anywhere, any other way I can utilize it? So we had this chat and stuff, and he told me about these groups on Facebook where people would like say, I need insulin. And again, don't do this. It's not allowed. I'm just explaining what I found. And I spoke to a young girl in the States who had sold all her belongings. And I'm, and I'm not exaggerating. She literally sold nearly the clothes off her back. She sold her television. She sold her car. She sold furniture just to buy insulin. And I was reading more and more stories like this, and it just went my heart because it's that oxygen to us. That's like, I don't know, like, Without insulin, it's very short amount of hours before, you know, something bad would be very sick or dead. So it's horrible to, it's, you know, the United States is, is not a poor country. I know that there's a huge, you know, gulf between the rich and the poor, but invariably it's not a third world country. So this shouldn't be happening. I know it happens all over the world as well, but. I think for some reason in the US, it just seems, and especially with the markups of the prices of insulin that the companies do. And yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, and there's a lot of politics. I think, I think it's just so, it's a, such a different picture from what the way that we talk about America externally, you know, you know, we're, look at us, we're, we're going, you know, we're going to the moon or we're building everything bigger. Or we're moving everything faster in our technology and our, and everything is so great. And, and then you really dig into it and you find stories like the one you shared of people who are, who are, who are sick and, and, and having to decide between paying rent or buying insulin and, or, you know, sending their kids, getting their kids to school and, and, you know, having to work multiple jobs and, and sacrificing their health, you know, for whatever they have to do in their life. And yeah, I, I think it is totally backwards. I think we should be embarrassed as, as America to continue to parade ourselves around the world the way we do without taking care of our people who need the most help. It's, you know, and I think, you know, when you're, when someone from uh, another country, especially like the UK, who certainly doesn't have everything figured out from a healthcare perspective, but is miles ahead of us. And you look at that and you say, oh my God, like I had no idea that in America, it was like this for, for people like me. And yeah, it's, it's funny when you were, you mentioned that charity, like during COVID, because we were all learning so much at the time it weren't sure what was safe to, you know, interact with from different places. You know, we were trying to, to send insulin. One of my good friends was trying to send insulin to another, a similar charity. And she had, her son had been diagnosed with type two and he had, had worked to get off medication, but she kept filling his prescription so that she could donate the insulin to people who needed it. Just a literal walking angel. And, and then, you know, she came to me and she was like, Hey, I can't, I have all this insulin. I can't get it to anyone. And Eritrea and I, a friend was going overseas to some people who were in the humanitarian crisis. And we were able to kind of on the sly, I agree with you. It's like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to break the rules, but sometimes you got to break the rules in a good way. And you know, so, you know, even in small, in small increments, like little, little bits can help people. And I think that's what community really means to me is that you find, find people who you connect with and, you know, who are willing to help each other. And I think that's, you know, even in the midst of all of the things that are all of the health disparities, all of the greed and all of the, the bad things that, that are, you know, set up about our healthcare system, what you find are the people who are willing to help each other out no, no matter what. And that is, that's really special.
Yeah, so that, thank, thank, you, thank you for sharing that. I know, I know that I can be. No, uh, thank you. Yeah. I just, yeah, so I just want to mention quickly, Victor Garber, the actor, he made him about this very thing. And I shared that on my social media. And I get, just, we just had the Super Bowl on Sunday and I know Nick Jonas secured a spot during the commercial break. And I, I saw a lot of people, even just my friends talking about it on, on social media. So not just about insulin for all, which is like the hashtag, but also tech, diabetes tech. And I think he, he uses the Dexcom system. He's a rep for them. He's their ambassador. And I think it's just like, this has two examples, those two, but it's, we need just that whole universal approach that everybody should have access, especially to insulin, but, and just and to the tech as well. And I mean, France, all type one diabetics have some CGM system. That is the law. In, in the UK, it was all pregnant women with type one or gestational diabetes have to have it. And then they just recently, as I said earlier, they've just recently changed the rules that all type one. So basically it's about, you know, and obviously we, it's, it's difficult to, to say there should be one blanket global rule, but what, what we do need is the internet to be accessible for everyone. I think it should be free for everyone. That's my opinion. I know that's not as easy as, 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 as I, as I'm saying it, but either free or very low cost, you know, well, for how much it costs to produce, not the market. And yeah, access to tech, because we all know how much this tech is, is helping people to manage their diabetes and also saving lives because the amount of money that is spent on looking after diabetics that are unwell in hospital and the amount of money that is saved in the long run because people were lowering their HbA1c with this tech and they're having less complications and less hospitalization. Sorry, getting very pumped. No, you're, spit, you're um, spitting. I like it. Yeah, you're, you're um, speaking my language because they, they talk so, so much about the cost of diabetes this, and you're, you're yeah, absolutely right. like, oh, well, this costs this, this costs this. Yeah, but we're saving money in the long run. I know the NHS have saved, like, the amount of money, like, it, it saved. I've, I've, I've seen the data because when I, when I first got my Libre, you know, you have to do, like, some online courses. It's very easy. But I read the data and uh, the, you know, the average person, once they get a CGM, drops, like, in the old, the old way from, like, an 8 HbA1c, 8% to, like, 6% within, like, a year or something. And I know that a lot of people, some of my friends, have had such fast improvement that it's damaged their eyes because they've they've gone so quickly from then having a high HBLZ to go to a better one that it's it can damage your eyes if you come down super quickly. So that's how how much it can improve your diabetes. And that is saving a lot of money in the world. So yeah, this all needs to be looked at and uh, as much, I wish I could do more and I am going to look into what else I can do. I'd love to be like a spokesperson for this sort of thing and do whatever I can because something needs to change. People are dying every day because they don't have insulin and it's just heartbreaking. I think it's really cool though that, so first of all, I agree with everything you said, say it three times, but one, it's so cool that your introduction to the diabetes community was through mutual aid because that was like, I have found my community of people like who also need the same life-saving liquid. But also just on another note that you mentioned when you're talking about CGMs, I think it's a little crazy and I'll just say this one thing, but the NHS is so much better than what we have in the United States, but the way that they give CGMs is still based off of one severe hypo a year. So they're like, oh, oh, we won't give it to you unless you had an emergency. So it just makes me think like all people with diabetes deserve access to their data and it shouldn't just be those of us who are on insulin. So I just wanted to say that. I yeah, will also so say <laughs> I will also say that the UK is one of the highest people and they have a lot of key opinion leaders in endocrinology that are fighting to change from HbA1c to working on time and range. Because if we all were looking at our time and range, then we all need access to CGMs. 
So I, I think it's really cool that the UK is one of the leaders in that. So yes, we should be embarrassed as Americans. And, and yes. Hair Trey is you, doing, doing a lot of work you, in her professional life on this as well. It's very, very good. Sorry, go ahead, Sam. I can, I can tell, like, you got the, you're spitting the facts here. Like, I don't have, you know, I, I'm very busy. And I, like I said, I wish I could do more, but I don't know all of this stuff. Like, you're, you're like, even what you just said about the NHS and once, once the bill happened, that's, this is another interesting point. That will be, I never heard that. They never said that to me. They have different roles for different hosts. Which it's is so weird. <laughs> right? So in my trust, it was if you, you if I do you know what I can't remember. There was just like loads of different hoops you'd have to jump through and there was a form and you have to tick which lines and you people keep trying. I have a friend who is he works in construction and he physically cannot prick his finger. I've seen his finger. His, his skin is so thick from working with his hands and he can't physically draw blood and they wouldn't give him a CGM. And he just had a really bad DKA and now he has a CGM. And I'm like, should not have taken a right. DKA for you to get this thing. And other places like, I know to get a pump, you have to give yourself more than three corrects and doses in a day. And it's just ridiculous, like you said. But yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's a postcode. Mm-hmm. Like, I still have friends that still can't get one. Um, even though they've changed the rules, it's still a bat and it should. Mm-hmm. It's a slow progress and hopefully the world will all adopt CGM for everyone because that is my life mission. But it's really cool that your mutual aid and your advocacy still shines through with all the work that you're doing being Stormtrooper Sam. Cause that's, I mean, also Thank just you. to see a, just to see a woman on screen. Like when I heard you say like, Oh, well, to test, like I just have to take off a piece of my armor and like stab myself. Like I'm imagining you on the set, like just where's my bag. Okay. There it is. Like, it's just a lot that you're juggling and you make it seem so easy, but I just want you to know you're doing incredible it, things. Do you know what? Do you know what? I, I'm back to just, get on with it type of person like I said when I was diagnosed I, I don't when I look back probably was really hard but I don't remember I just remember all the fun stuff the, the, the cuddly toys and the walkman because that's that is my that's how I am like we could sit and we could cry or we could just get on with it and see what happens and that is how I am but actually I do stop and think yeah you're kind of a bit of a battle because being a storm trooper is not easy it's tough it's uncomfortable it's painful it's hot it's cold i have permanent injury from being a stormtrooper i have to get regular treatments from an osteopath and chiropractor because i have damage because i've worn that thing for so long for such extended periods of time it's not an easy job being on a film set for anyone not just the stormtrooper is not an easy job it's not nine to five you don't get regular breaks. I'm not going to have my lunch at 12. Blah, 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 blah. And to do that and to be diabetic, having a high pillow on step and then having to go back like straight away, even though your, your sugars haven't come up yet, but you're in that seat. So you have to be there and you're shaking, going high and needing to pee, but you're in a storm chicken costume. Like just that's a woman is difficult anyway. I have a shoe week, but. Because you're high and you need to go. Um, I was filming recently and I, for the first time in 30 years, I lost my internet. Guys, don't ever switch. And it was horrific. It was awful. And I very nearly just asked to call 911. I get an ambulance. Luckily, I had my face off. My long acting, and so I took some of that, and I just drank a lot of water, and it started to come down. But yeah, I always have spares before anyone asks me. But I, I just changed the pet. I changed the cartridge the night before to the spare one, and yeah. Anyway, I, we I think we've all been there. Down. Well, this first time it never happened to me. Yeah, it was so scary, but I have to carry on filming because I was very important to that scene so yeah it is tough and 
I don't, I, I think I just, I take for granted how strong, I am very strong. I know that. I have had a lot of adversity in my life and I just, to me, impossible is nothing. Like, I don't like the word no. I don't like to be told no. I don't like to be told that I can't do something, especially if it's because I'm a woman or a diabetic or a person of colour. So, yeah. yeah. I'm just going to get on with it. And yet I should probably tap myself on the back more because of, of what of what I do. But my thing is just carry on doing it. And maybe if I inspire people for whatever reason, that's a great thing. Because the higher you go, the, the, the more people you have access to speak to, like you guys. And then, you know, we can just keep spreading the love and inspiring people to to do good things and be great and to to make change, affect change where it's needed, like with diabetes and insulin and CG. Well, Sam, I can I can absolutely 100% confirm that you have inspired me and, and I know Eritrea as well and, and many, many others. Just to learn, like learning that there's a stormtrooper with diabetes, you know, Star Wars, I'm a huge Star Wars nerd. I grew up on Star Wars. It's one of, you know, the things that's brought a ton of joy to my life and being able to see somebody on screen behind that mask is living with diabetes just made me feel like a million bucks. I could have run through a wall when I heard that. So thank you so much thank for, you. for the time. And you know, I want to be conscious of your time as well, to, but you know, you took for, for the listeners, you took this interview right in the middle of a very demanding shooting schedule and we're super accommodating with your schedule. So I just I'm very grateful for you and your time. And I can't wait for people to hear this episode. It's just gonna, it's going to be amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Like, I could, I have so much more to say, as you know, I like to speak, but yeah, maybe we could chat, chat another time, but I, I have, it's, it's really important for me to, to do stuff like this. And thank you so much for having me. I was, I've been a huge uh, admirer of what you guys do for a very long time. So when you reached out to me and said, let's chat, I was so excited. So thank you so much. And yeah, anytime. Well, I am we not a Star Wars fan. I'm not a Star Wars fan, but I am a, Sam- a Samantha fan. So I, Rob, write down what movie she's in and all of the scenes because I will go watch it. So for everyone else who's not a Star Wars girly, join me. We can become them. Like, let's do it. I love it. We have it. a friend. <laughs> you guys are making me emotional. No, thank you so much. <laughs>